I think we're in business here, Amy, and uh, I want to welcome you to The Glenn Show. This is Glenn Lowry, The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv, at glennlowry.substack.com, and at my YouTube channel, Glenn Lowry Show. I'm with Amy Wax, who's professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania, who is my friend and is a frequent uh, guest on The Glenn Show, although it's been a while, Amy. Yes, about a year. Do you know that I'm glad to be back. people have I'm been writing to be in to me saying, what's wrong? Why don't you have Amy Wax on? Are you, have, are you canceling her? <laughs> now, you're not cancelable, are you? People would never cancel you. <laughs> I've been canceled so much that I feel like I've sort of gone through the tunnel to the other side of cancellation, which is uh, pretty liberating in a lot of ways. Uh, they're still trying to fire me at my law school. They've got some complaint that they're processing, but of course they have this massive bureaucracy and the complaint is wending its way through this, this hideous DIE bureaucracy. I'm not terribly worried about it. Um, Do you want to so, talk about it? Are you willing to talk about it? Well, there's Are you allowed to talk about it? Oh, well, I, I, nobody has muzzled me. Uh, I, I mean, I, I guess somewhere there's some clause that says that it's confidential. I'm sure I'll have all these people coming down on me. But the, uh, there's not much to say about it. There are a couple of things to, to note about it that are interesting. First of all, it's a complaint that's filed by alumni of color from past years. Some, you know, like eight years ago, people who I've never had in my class. Uh, barely know me. I don't recognize their names. Uh, so these kind of accusations are coming out of the air. But the accusations in the complaint are all anonymous. No one who is actually complaining about me of the supposed things I did to them is willing to be named. These are alumni so, who assert you did something while they were enrolled yes, years ago. I did something to them. And of course, I have no idea who they are because they refuse to be named. They're afraid that I'll retaliate against them. I mean, I don't know. I have no power over anybody. So, What do they allege that, that you have done? Well, it's very hard to get a handle on what they're alleging because it's, it's so preposterous. So I'll give you one example of, of the complaint. Um, because of Amy Wax's, you know, antics, when we go to be interviewed by law firms, all they want to talk about is Amy Wax and, you know, the awful things she did. And so that ends up monopolizing our time being interviewed. And that comprises discrimination. And she's responsible for that. I mean, those kinds of complaints it, that I'm somehow spoiling their interview because of my mere existence. And this is a fireable offense. I mean, does that not sound preposterous? Um, a second complaint. Yes, it uh, sounds preposterous. It's, 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 it is preposterous. It, that is the order of, you know, those are the sorts of things that are being alleged. Well, uh, we should tell people who don't know that Amy Wax is infamous for having written an op-ed in which she advocated that Western culture was superior. And again, you can correct me if I get this wrong, but that when you look comparatively at, uh, at the cultural uh, antecedents of success in modern society, Western culture was desirable and had features that we should, uh, uh, you know, uh, affirm. Uh, and who has also uh, said publicly that in her experience, uh, students at the bottom of her class tended disproportionately to be students of color. And this has created a firestorm of protest uh, at the law school where your dean has sanctioned you uh, and so on. And that's the basis, I assume, of the complaints coming from these alumni who say all that the interviewer wants to talk about is the infamous Amy Wax. Well, right. And there's one more infraction that I have that made a huge fuss, which was that a national conservatism convention. This has become sort of an annual thing. I think you might have been at the one in Orlando. I was at the one in Orlando. You had to tell everybody, yeah. did you? I was not there. <laughs> I, was not I was hoping to stay in the closet a bit longer, Amy, but OK. Uh, right. I, 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 was, I was not invited to speak because the one I did speak at, I created such a fire. I want to hear about I that. I want to hear about that. But I want people to know I'm just joking about being in the closet because my speech is now the lead article in this issue of First Thing. 
Things and the January 2022 issue of the magazine First Things. My right. National Conservatism Conference speech is being published. I'm proud of it. Uh, I survived the National Conservatism Conference without any long-term damage. And in fact, I made some friends there. So I hope not. <laughs> yeah, well, now you're, you're out of the closet because your speech on Black patriotism is everywhere. And actually, Europe sent out an email and it's one of the leading highlights of it. So you can't hide. Oh, it was. But yeah, I go ahead. It, I want to hear about your, your experience. Well, no, it, the year before, before COVID, I had said I had given a talk on immigration in which I had said that I thought our policy should be geared much more to cultural compatibility, you know, but we have to face up to the fact that there's a Western world and then there's a non-Western world or a third world in which many of our values are not shared. In fact, people are barely familiar with them. They're certainly not inculcated and that it's just harder to assimilate those people or to have confidence that our way of life will continue if we bring a lot of people in who are not familiar with it, who don't have fealty to it or uh, allegiance to it or whatever. And these are not, you know, these are not original ideas on the right. But unfortunately, I said this might result in a shift in the racial profile of people come in. We'll, we'll obviously have fewer people from Africa. We'll have fewer people from some parts of Asia, and it'll be more white, not that that many white people want to come to the United States. And this is what made the headlines. Amy Wax advocates for, you know, excluding people of color from immigration, which of course isn't what I said at all. Um, I said, this might be the result, and therefore conservatives might be nervous about it. I was talking about what conservatives are willing to advocate. And you know, conservatives are very skittish about about racial effects. In fact, that's something I'm, in the essays that I sent to you that I've written about, that uh, one of the reasons fighting wokeness is so difficult, I think, and there's been so little success, I mean, there have been pockets of success, we can talk about the school wars, um, is because conservatives are so confused and ambivalent about the whole disparate impact equal results uh, phenomenon. Uh, and that, that I think is a problem on the right. People need to get their head on straight that uh, under current conditions, if they're gonna go back to colorblindness, if they're gonna go back to impartiality and you know the classic meritocracy, they are not going to see, we are not going to see proportional outcomes. Yeah, hold on, hold on, Amy. Uh, I, I actually agree with that. And I want to talk about that. But uh, I want to just ask you a question about this uh, point about immigration, because I'm noticing that um, a, a large number of the immigrants who are coming from some parts of the non-Western world are, are doing quite well. I, I mean, I'm noticing that South Asians, for example, are uh, all over the tech industries. I'm noticing that the East Asian first and second generation immigrants, you know, from Korea, from China, are are yeah. doing very well. And if you were to rank different ethnic groups by, you know, income or occupational status or whatever, you'd find a number of uh, non-Western immigrant uh, populations, you know, doing quite well in terms of wealth and uh, PhDs and you know, so forth and so on. So, non-Western is a pretty broad category. Uh, and uh, the cultural characteristics of some of these immigrants. So that's one point that some immigrants are doing quite well who are not from the West. The other point, though, is that it's very selective who decides to come. And even if I come from what Donald Trump called a shithole country, even if, even if I come from a place that's not at all doing well, I might be an individual who, by in virtue of electing to get the heck out of there, uh, has characteristics that would uh, redound to my benefit once I get here. So you paint with such a broad brush. How do you how do you answer that uh, concern? It is a broad brush. I agree. It's it's a mass generalization. I think it it does need to be refined to reflect a couple of facts that you pointed out. The first is that you know we are seeing signal success of East Asians and South Asians who come here, but of course, as you recognize, they're a highly selected part of the population. They're a tiny, tiny elite. These places are so populous. You know, they have so many people that if you bring in this tiny, tiny upper crust, 
right? Uh, you, you'll you get a kind of critical mass of very capable people. I mean, there's no question about that whatsoever. So we have to distinguish mass immigration, which we're getting from the Hispanic, right, south of the border, which I think poses different questions and challenges from uh, the Asian elites that we're getting. Now, that doesn't mean that that this influx of Asian elites is unproblematic. I actually think it's problematic. I don't think it's problematic because of dysfunction or underclass behavior, because we're not seeing that. Uh, although if we had mass migration from those countries, I think that would be a different matter. I think it's because there is this, um, let's call it danger of the dominance of an Asian elite in this country. And what does that mean? What is that going to mean? to change the culture. And that's not a popular idea to say that. Like, why, why would you ever say anything? Well, what's the like danger? What, what, what would be wrong with having a lot of uh, Chinese or uh, of Indian or uh, uh, Korean engineers, physicians, uh, uh, computer scientists, uh, and uh, whatnot running around here, creating value, uh, enlivening the society? I mean, I don't see how we lose from that. How do we lose from that? Does the spirit of liberty beat in their breast, Glenn? That is my question. Now, whenever I say that, here's what people say. Well, I mean, if you look at like the white legacy population, uh, certainly the elites, does the spirit of liberty beat well, in their breast? Well, that's the point. I mean, I, I, yeah, that's a good point. They've become so woke, but I consider that a very negative and dangerous What do you mean by the spirit of liberty? Are you saying they're not Democrats or somehow they're... I mean, people who are wicked. I mean, small d out, Democrats. Who are mistrustful of, of, you know, centralized concentrations of authority, who have a kind of don't tread on me attitude, who are uh, focused on the Bill of Rights, on our freedoms, on our liberties, on on, you know, sort of small scale personal responsibility who are nonconformist in a good ways. And, you know, I think it's been written about Asians tend to be more conformist to whatever the dominant uh, ethos is. So the wokeness, I'll give you an example of what concerns me, okay, of the sort of thing that's happening. And it's very caught up with the fashionable multiculturalist anti-American sentiments that wokeness represents because wokeness is now the luxury belief of the upper class and that's what Asians think they have to ape if they're going to be upper class they look at you know upper class white people and see what they believe and they say well we have to believe what they believe because we want to be upper class too so if you go into medical schools you'll see that indians south asians are now uh rising stars uh, in medicine. They're sort of the new Jews, I guess you could say. But these diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, which are poisoning the scientific establishment and the medical establishment now, and I really think they are, who are the people on the front lines? South Asian women doctors, they are there at the barricades saying, Oh, America is a racist society. It's an awful, terrible society. Of course, they chose to come here from India. Nobody ever asked them, like, why are you here? Uh, it's a terrible, awful, racist, irredeemable, evil society, and we need to revolutionize and reform it. Why are South Asian women saying that? Well, well, Amy, why are they in the forefront of accusing us what, and of advocating anti-American What has their South asian this got to do with it? I mean, you just mentioned Jews yourself. You, you and I are both academics. There are a lot of Jews in the, in the academy. The academy is uh, rotten with the very wokeness that you're condemning. Am I going to blame the Jews for that? Well, yes. I, I bl I'm Jewish. I blame the Jews for that. She said it, everybody. She said it. The I didn't. Jews okay. Have abused their power. <laughs> they have abused their prominence, abused their power, and abused their uh, dominance in the academy. Uh, in my mind, but but and, I don't attribute you know, it to their Jewishness. I I would attribute it to the the logic of the institutional dynamic in which they are embedded the academy, which has its flaws, of which the susceptibility to this kind of postmodern relativism 
and this obsession about identity is one. And so those who happen to be in the academy, I find disproportionately are adherents of this ideology, which I abhor, but not because they're Jews, likewise, not because they're from India. The well, see, I, I disagree with you. I think I think there is, let, let's go back to the, the South Asians who just love to bash America and be part of the whole DIE push, right? What, it, what is it about them that they are kind of scrambling all over each other to be in the forefront of this? You know, they, I, I think there is a certain uh, conformity uh, and, and sort of instrumentalism to the way they see rising in a society, which is, you know, forget the principles, forget about whether it's true or not, forget about whether America is a good place, a bad place, or a middling place. We see that this is the trend, and we want to get on the bandwagon and be important and powerful and prominent, so we're going to be a part of this. And, and it's mindless. I mean, why should someone who emigrated from India, no, let me finish, and has taken advantage of everything our society has to offer, who ha is leading the good life, who is part of the elite, why shouldn't that person be abjectly grateful and you know, recognize overtly all the wonderful things about our country? Why should they be on the ramparts bashing our country? I just, the, the, me makes no well, sense. Well, let me speak for them <laughs> for a moment. They are merely conforming to the ethos that they have uh, inherited when they entered into these institutions. They didn't bring wokeness with them. They didn't invent wokeness. They're just trying to get by. Uh, and by the way, many of them are deeply ambivalent about it. I think your characterization, your broad brush of uh, South Asian, therefore, uh, adherence to this wokeness is, is not accurate. I mean, I, I think, for example, I just read Matt Taibbi's recent post about Loudoun County, Virginia. Uh, and he says, what was the race story in Loudoun County? This is a short version of his, I think, very fine uh, reporting. He says, it wasn't about critical race theory and how do you talk about uh, race and slavery? It was about South Asian uh, uh, first and second generation immigrant families who want to get their kids into um, you know, uh, the top uh, technical school in the area and who want gifted and talented. And, and who are pissed off at uh, the uh, uh, implicit racism against their success that the equity mongers who say there are not enough blacks and the gifted and talented and therefore we have to get rid of it um, uh, are the, the Thomas Jefferson High School of Science and Technology, which is not in Loudoun County, but which Loudoun County sends many of its students to under a special program that was called into question because there are not enough blacks in the... And he says, that's the real story that got Terry McAuliffe defeated in Virginia. Brown people, not white people, objecting to wokeness. So, so I, you know. Well, you're right. I mean, there is, you know, these are rank and file people. These are not sort of intelligentsia academics. Maybe a few of them are, but most, yeah, of, most them of them are, are engineers and computer science yeah, types who are working on a, federal contracts for, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I think, you know, there are some divides within the South Asian Indian community along those lines. But even the ones in Loudoun County who are objecting to, you know, the, the dissolution of the meritocracy, which they think favors them, which it does, uh, their their critique is limited. OK, they, they stay away from race because they know that that's, you know, a third yeah. rail. Uh, of course, it's impossible to advocate for the meritocracy and stay away from race, as the two have been melded together by the woke uh, politburos. So we said they're treading on very da dangerous ground. So I agree that there are there are factions within the South Asian community, but they still vote Democratic, Glenn. And the leadership, leadership in medical schools and science, they are still embracing wokeness with Venomous enthusiasm. Venomous. <laughs> I, I just stare at them and think, I want to ask them, why are you here? Of course, that's a forbidden question. You're not allowed to say, why are you here? That's that's aggressive. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, I mean, like, this is persistent? close to love it or leave it, Amy. I, I'm sure oh, you don't want yes. to, you America love it or leave it. Come on. No, but there there is an it, there's an intermediate position between love it and leave or leave it, which is really what CRT CRT controversy is all about, which is balance. We never hear, we rarely hear the positive case, the praise of the founders, the praise of the the traditions of the legacy population, the other side of the story about the fate of Black America. I wrote a Newsweek piece about this. I said, I really against censoring CRT because that's not the American way. You know, the government isn't really supposed to dictate what's being said, although they have some leeway in the education sphere. What I would like to see is someone saying, okay, we have Ta-Nehisi Coates, we have Ivron Kendi, but let's bring in Shelby Steele. Let's bring in Glenn Lowry. Let's bring in Bob Woodward. Uh, am I pronouncing his name correctly? Let's bring in Thomas Sowell and let's hear what they, let the students hear what they have to say about what the way forward for Blacks should be and how they can best advance their own interests. And they just never hear that. They literally never hear it, Glenn. I'm telling you. They don't know who these people are. Yeah. Uh, so what, what can we do about that? I mean, that yeah. needs to happen, I, okay? I, I want to blame the institutions. I don't want to blame the ethnicity of the people who are in the institutions. I want to say conformity is something to the, what I might understand to be the spirit of the in enterprise that I'm embedded in. I want to get to the top. I want to get along. I want to have allies. And I don't want to have opposition. And, and so I, my antennae are up and I kind of see the way the wind is blowing. And I have a tendency to conform to that. Uh, and I think that that's a very universal dynamic. And, uh, you know, but it's not uh, admirable. It's not admirable. But and, I don't want to blame it, the fact that these people are immigrants on this. As I say, what about the Jews? I mean, uh, it, it, and if I were to set out and say, look, the academy is rife with these Jewish people who are all on the left and who are all these, uh, you know, sort of closet uh, socialists. Uh, and darn it, you know, I mean, Ellis Island was a good thing, you know, but one consequence for American democracy is that it has dumped all these Jews on us who are so susceptible to to left. Come on, Amy, that's anti-Semitism, at least. No, it that's isn't. What they, no, they, it that's what they taught me in Chicago, that that was. I, okay. <laughs> well, I don't, I, I'm hard company with people who say that that kind of criticism of Jews and Jews, you know, outsized influence is anti-Semitism. And I realize that I'm in the minority on that. But Glenn, you know, because you're okay. a realist yeah. and you're, you're uh, intellectually honest. That even though, quote unquote, conformity is universal, which is a very unhelpful statement because, you know, it doesn't tell you how universal it is and how it parses out in different cultures, that cultures differ. The propensities in some cultures for behavior X, right, is greater than in other cultures. So even though you can find conformists everywhere... It is entirely possible that you find more of a leaning towards uh, conformity in some places than others, in some cultures than others, more of a concern with rights and liberty and independence in some cultures than others. And, you know, these differences exist. Okay. These differences absolutely exist. And we're not blaming, you know, to use the word blaming, I think, is pandemic. Okay, okay. It's one thing to I, describe. I it's another thing to assign fault. I, I agree with that. You know, Jews are attracted to and they have the capability to enter into the intelligentsia and be a part of academic communities. They are highly present and dominant in academic communities. And... You know, we have the university today in its abject state. Uh, we have a lot of Jews still in the universities and put the two together. And I think Jews have a lot to answer for it just numerically, just through their predominance. And of course, their their susceptibility to these idealistic pie in the sky socialist ideas uh, which, you know, I don't share that vulnerability. So I'm mystified by it. 
But uh, there it is. That's descriptively accurate. Well, you- now, I don't, you know, the hatred of Jews, the kind of obsessional anti-Semitism that you see in, in tiny pockets on the right. And let's not exaggerate how many people are like this because it, it's very few. OK, that. You know, that I reject. You, you see no connection between the, this thing that you just got through rejecting, which is on the fringe, and the statement that you it's just right. made, the stereotyping uh, categorization of Jews that you just, and you are Jewish yourself, it should be noted. But I'm totally Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know this from the inside out. Believe me. Uh, I see it. These are the people that uh, raised me. These are the people that I grew up with. I, I get it. Okay. But there's nothing wrong with stereotyping. When stereotyping is understood correctly, number one, we know it's not about every person. So let's not be disingenuous about it. When people say, oh, stereotyping is awful. You say, well, only if you attribute a particular quality or a particular propensity or trait to every single person in the group. But you know, that's a straw man. Nobody's doing that. Okay. Um, they're saying there are these tendencies, these leanings. There are more people like this in this group than maybe in other groups. Um, and, you know, so Jews are in the academy. They are, once again, they're spearheading wokeness. They're embracing it, uh, especially Jewish women, heaven forfend. Um, and- Okay, Amy, uh, give me a chance here. Um, I'm looking at uh, the Brooklyn Tech, uh, uh, Bronx uh, High School of Science, Stuyvesant, um, Hunter College High School, I'm seeing a lot of Asians. Um, I'm looking at who's doing computer science at Brown, uh, who's doing physics, uh, who's doing applied math and econ. I see a lot of Asians. Um, I'm looking at what's happening in Silicon Valley. I see a lot of Asians. Uh, I'm thinking about the 21st century and where it's headed and how the United States, in, given the rise of China, can maintain its uh, position of world dominance. dominance. And I see that the role that Asian immigration to the United States is playing in, in sustaining uh, America's uh, leading position is, is fundamental. I don't want to do without these people. I think we need these people. Now, even if I accept some of your cultural argument, it seems to me the upside, uh, I'm talking about Asian selective immigration of skilled people who, with their children and their grandchildren, enrich the, the fabric of American intellectual and economic life, I'd say, let them come. I mean, in fact, that's the only way we're going to su survive the challenge of, uh, of the Chinese uh, behemoth uh, going forward another generation or two. Uh, because if I look at what's going on in the legacy population, uh, white and black, <laughs> of, of the United States of America, I see a lot of mediocrity. I see a lot of laggardliness. I see a lot of decay and corruption and uh, so forth, of people not realizing the full human potential, it seems to me that just like in the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, where immigration was such a boon to the American project, so too for us going forward in the 21st century. I don't know what the alternative is. Think about what you're saying. You're saying, you know, the, well, first of all, let's just clarify that percentage of Asians in the population now is, I think it's 7%. Yeah, something like that. It's, it's little, much smaller than you'd think. Yeah. It's less we than 10%, them, but they're coming. Much less than 10%. Yeah. But we're seeing it because we're on the coast. We're in the university. We're going to see it. Right. But, but Glenn, we've got the whole heartland. You know, we, we can't just kind of give up. And, and this is, you know, right talking points. I, I agree. You were at the conservatism convention. You know what the concerns and preoccupations are. We've got this whole heartland population. Okay, this is the population, the descendants of people that built this country, that conceived this country, that thought of the basic compact and the basic paradigm and the, the fundamental ideas of this country for, you know, a couple of centuries. And now you're basically saying they're spent. It's over for them. They're sunk into mediocrity and indifference. Well, I agree, those things are happening, but you know, why are they happening? What can we do to revitalize? Can we revitalize uh, this quote, let's just say it, of this mainly white population? And of course, then we have the black population and they're a whole 
pose a whole different set of challenges and problems. I'm not sure they're different, but okay. But they, maybe they're just a matter of difference of degree. Yeah, okay. Right? But but but, we but, have, but we don't have to choose between well, we don't have to choose between uh, revivification of our uh, legacy populations on the one hand, and an openness to uh, the talent that the world has to offer us on the other. We can do both of those things. They're they're not mutually so exclusive. I mean, what what percentage do you think uh, do you think we should just be the sort of polyglot boarding house? Do you think that's a viable paradigm? I mean, we've got the whole the diversity mindset here that is being constantly hammered into us that this is just a wonderful, great thing, that there's no downside. It's all upside. Um, I'm I'm convinced that's not true. The world, uh, the world is I, getting smaller, Amy. And I, and I, you know, just like I want goods to be able to move across borders relatively uninhibited, I, I'm, I'm inclined to think about sensible openness to having people move across borders, not mass and unregulated immigration across the southern border by anybody who wants to come, but uh, a, a structured program of uh, openness to talent who, who want to enrich what it is that we're doing here. We can be, we can be uh, guarded about it. We don't, we don't have to uh, just f fling the doors open, but uh, I, I also don't think we need to build a wall. Not against the, the talented people who are going to come here and start businesses and uh, generate patents and, you know, publish it in the, at the frontier of the, you know, I, I read a piece, I think it was in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, I'm pretty sure that's where it was, by some mathematicians, American mathematicians, all of whom had been born in some other country, who were observing that Chinese universities are now successfully recruiting top-rate academic talent in mathematics from American universities, not all of whom are Chinese, some of whom are just professors of mathematics at American universities who get a better deal and find that they have a, a better environment to, to pursue their research uh, uh, at universities in China. And, you know, the world's a small place, Amy. So I, I, we can't, we can't uh, uh, deny ourselves the benefit of the talents that may exist wherever they may come from. That, that would be my view. Well, what's your theory for why Americans are not going into these fields, not, you know, getting the PhDs, getting, uh, you know, in, in science, in, in, even in economics or fields like that. I mean, what's, what's your theory for the kind of pall of despair that's settled of lassitude, that's settled over people who are not at the very tippy top, who are not, you know, part of the elite? Uh, and their unwillingness, their, their sort of lack of, of energy. You know, of, um, Yuval Levin just wrote an essay about this. He says, we, our problems of dysfunction are not totally a matter of unruliness and, you know, uh, lawlessness now. They're a matter of passivity, of indifference, indifference to individual progress and ambition and indifference to the future reflected in, in our falling birth rates as well, which I think is really a cardinal sign of societal decadence. Um, you know, as elites, it's very easy for us to be obsessed with excellence. Let's bring in the best and the brightest, right? But that's just a tiny part of society. Um, it's the rest of society that seems to be going to hell in a, in a handbasket and nobody really understands why. I think there is a, just a complete lack of understanding of why there is a shift in mood uh, in the country as a whole. Now, do you do you think it's just a matter of when you bring in the best of the brightest all over the all over the world, uh, our population can't compete? I mean, because we built America and we we went to the moon and we did compete for a very long time, but maybe it's because we were protected. I, I don't know. We accomplished a lot. So I, I heard this argument against the visas, what they call them, H-1B or something like that, the special right. visas that they give uh, companies the right to use to bring talent in, say, software engineers from uh, South Asia or whatever. And this guy, I don't want to name him, uh, but he, he's a relatively prominent uh, defender of the American nationalist interest against the immigration of talent. He says, uh, I'll tell you what, 
when Google and Microsoft can tell me who is the smartest kid uh, coming off of the uh, Black Ghetto of Oakland or East Palo Alto, Alto, smartest kid there, might be in a gang, might flunked out of school, but smart, smartest kid. When they can tell me who the smartest kid in East Palo Alto is, and then they tell me he's not up to snuff, I'll give him a visa to bring somebody in from South Asia. Uh, by, which he, by which he meant, I know the talent is there. Uh, there are diamonds in the rough and they're not looking for them and they don't have any incentive to look for them because they've got an easy safety valve. Exactly. You know, they, they need an engineer, go find one from East Palo Alto, get them into a private school somewhere, get them a tutor or something like that, get, you know, and, or her, or her, and, and uh, bring them along. You're not really trying to, to solve the problem right where you are you, because you have an e easy out. And maybe there is something to that. Maybe there's something to the fact that uh, education policy, which must have something to do with this malaise that you're describing, the failure to excite kids about mathematics. I mean, that's what I think the, in the tech areas, the main obstacle is our kids are very poorly trained K through 12 and in the, the first four years of college at the technical curriculum. They don't pay enough attention to it. They don't get their uh, skills developed in it. Um, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe if the private sector didn't have that safety valve of being able to go offshore for their talent, they'd uh, be involved in school committee elections. They'd be involved in developing curricula. They'd be involved in innovative supplements to the K through 12 education that people are getting in the classroom and find ways of uh, bringing that, that uh, human potential out in our domestic population. I, I would be for that. Yeah, but you see why the failure to do that well, and, and it's a very complicated subject, uh, is so caught up with the influence of wokeness and this equalitarian obsession that has sort of taken over, uh, you know, education. I mean, we now have this dominance of a education establishment that is affirmatively anti-excellence, affirmatively anti uh, meritocratic. They, they what's happening to the mathematics curriculum in California is is emblematic. I mean, yeah. you're not going to get any place when you say, "Well, nobody needs to learn calculus. Calculus is racist. Calculus is a, a token of white supremacy." And all of the that nonsense. is an abomination. I mean, that that is but just it's, horrible. It's, I, it, it's happening in New York City. It's happening all over the country, and the Democrats are in their pocket. The Democrats won't speak out against it because they see that as playing into right wing priorities. So the politicization of this has given them, I think, a, a free hand. And it's given them a free hand to inculcate this oppressor, oppressee, wokeness paradigm into students, which I actually think saps their ambition. It's interesting because I've, I've recently gone to dinner with a number of uh Let's, I won't call them alt-right because that's the left's term, but uh, very right-oriented people, young people, male people mostly as they are. And one man who I socialize with who's about to get married, there was only one topic he wanted to talk about. How do I keep my kids from going woke? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say this though, Amy. The reason this <laughs> thing in California, <laughs> this antipathy to calculus to the pre-calculus classes that they teach kids in high school is terrible. I think it's two things. First of all, you can't do anything in STEM if you don't master calculus. So that's disqualifying. Secondly, it's so empowering the, you know, to a kid. I mean, imagine a poor kid whose environment is not all that stimulating, whose parents might not be all that swift and, and, and educated, whose peers might be doing a lot of uh, destructive stuff, but he's sitting in his uh, library carol or he's sitting in his little study corner someplace and he's turning the pages and he's discovering, or she, the power of these mathematical methods, the beauty of them. Connections are blossoming in this kid's mind. The world is opening up to this kid. I mean, this is an anti-poverty program. The, the intellectual uh, vigor that comes out of the mastery of something that's difficult. And, and you apply yourself to it and you get command of it and then you get to use it and you use it to solve problems that you never even could have thought of before. This is liberating. This is empowering. So uh, it's, hor right. it's horrible. It's horrible that this would be denied to the kids who are capable of it 
because there are so many kids who are not. I mean, we, we shouldn't punish the kids who are capable of this uh, on behalf of uh, a faux egalitarianism that levels everything down to mediocrity instead of letting those who have the ability and the interest to show their, uh, show their mettle. Well, of course, that's precisely what we're doing. And you have to understand, going back to something you said, math is difficult. Math is hard. It requires a lot of effort, a lot of focus and concentration. And not everybody can do it. Not everybody can do it well, right? right. But the problem is we now have a system, and it's everywhere. It's pervasive, where the minute you encounter obstacles and difficulties or get a poor grade or you know get bumped out of a gifted class, the explanation, the all-purpose explanation is racism. Right. Any kind of evaluation that distinguishes people is racism. I'm not exaggerating here, Glenn. I am not exaggerating. You know, just leafing through the newspaper right? today, what do we have? We have an article about the exam schools in Philadelphia, Masterman, Central, the you know equivalent of Bronx Science and the like. Uh, we have an article by a black woman saying, isn't it wonderful that we're getting rid of these exams of these, you know, hurdles of these selection methods, and everybody can go to these schools because these selection methods are uh, racist. They're white supremacist. We got to get rid of them. And, and, and that effort has succeeded in Philadelphia. It, they were trying that in New York, and they got struck down. Uh, they have succeeded in with Masterman, which is their jewel in the crown. All right, Masterman is no longer a school that you have to qualify for academically, at least if I could believe this article. I mean, very often you're not getting accurate information in these articles, okay. so it's all euphemistic. But Masterman is no longer Stuyvesant. It's no longer uh, Bronx Science. It's just another high school. And everybody's going along with it. But there's nothing in these articles. It's almost verboten to recognize that people differ in intellectual ability, that not everybody you know, can has the the chops to be a professional. But I mean, all of these concepts have been discredited, not just discredited, they're banished. They're not even there. Another article, why are there so few blacks in the C-suite reviewing all of these corporations? You know, blacks are, they say they're 12% of the population. I think it's more like 13 or 14%. Uh, this company has only 3% black executives. This company has only 8%. Um, that's terrible. That has to change. Nothing about the pipeline. Nothing about yeah. you know, what, what do blacks major in in school? Uh, how do they do in school? Uh, you know, are they equally qualified right. at this point in time? Is the expectation of equal representation or proportional representation a realistic Indeed. one? Nothing like that. Nothing like that. And Glenn, how many articles have you read like that? Uh, a many, I, a great many. And they're, and they're very uh, profoundly wrong along the lines that you outlined. I see two, and I'll just say this briefly, uh, fundamental objections. One of them is you can't possibly expect groups that differ in their culture and in their uh, practices, their behavior, their patterns of life to produce equivalent numbers of people in every professional pursuit. There are going to be differences because groups are different. They, some are more oriented toward uh, intellectual activity than others are. There are differences everywhere you look. I mean, if you look in the sports and entertainment, you don't see an equal proportionate representation of various groups. Why should I expect to see an equal proportionate representation of groups um, in uh, medical research or in uh, STEM fields or uh, in uh, the European history or it, et cetera. So I don't take groups seriously if I assume that there have to be equal representation of groups in every occupation because groupness itself, the things that make groups different from one another relate to what it is that people are going to do with their time, which affects how they're going to be apportioned across the various uh, 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 fields of professional activity. That's one thing that's wrong with that way of thinking. But there's another thing that's wrong with it that I think is much more profound, which is that if you think underrepresentation is ipso facto an indictment of the structure, then you also think that overrepresentation is an indictment of the structure. That is to say, the groups that do well are somehow illegitimate if the groups who do poorly have been robbed. Their lack of success, the groups that do poorly, is in effect 
being uh, a consequence of the illegitimate oversuccess of the groups that it was. So you're indicting the Jews. So you're indicting the Chinese immigrants. You're, you're in, you know, the people who do well are somehow doing so on the backs of the people who do poorly, according to your theory. And that's, first of all, sociologically wrong. Uh, and secondly, it's politically disastrous. Right. And it's this this implication of, of some kind of sinister mechanism or influence, of course, is absolutely part and parcel of, you know, the approach. Um, it's why I think anti-Semitism, and we can, you know, argue about what real anti-Semitism is, is on the rise. It, it's, I think, fueling a lot of anti-Asian sentiment, like, why is this happening? They've got some secret sauce, you know, sinister secret sauce, I guess you could call it, the, the triple S, uh, that accounts for it. And all of it, you know, is, it, what's it tied into? It's tied into a refusal to recognize that, no, not everybody is equal. Not everybody is equally smart. Not everybody is equally diligent, uh, capable, driven, whatever it is uh, that has been banished. We need absolutely equal results. So I guess my I have two questions for you, given that this idea is just has us in its grip. Um, first of all, what do you think the best way is to fight this? I mean, you're you're at Brown. You know that this is just accepted as the gospel truth. Uh, anybody who deviates from it is, you know, endangering themselves. They may get away with it, but as, as you often do get away with it because you're so reasonable and articulate in the way that they've just decided to give you a pass. I don't know. Well, I'm also um, black, Amy. I think if I were white, black, if I were I white, I'd be finished. I'd, I'd be over there with Amy yeah. Wax. So. <laughs> well, I'm a woman. That hasn't helped me at all. I, uh, anyway, maybe it has. I don't know. Well, uh, yeah, I, when you're being black, you're given a pass. But for those of us who are not black, uh, Glenn, uh, you know, although I understand that race is socially constructed, yeah, um, I did not take construction one hundred and one. Um, what What do you think the best way of fighting this is, and what's the most effective way? Uh, and the second question I have for you, and it's a little bit orthogonal to this, so we'll park it on the side, is what what do you do about the fact, and I teach conservatism, so this is a big theme here, that people value stability, sameness, familiarity, being around people like themselves, um, that you know, forcing on them all of these individuals from this panoply of alien cultures, uh, different backgrounds, different places, different value systems and legacies, and, you know, the whole diversity shtick, that, that this apotheosis of diversity, no dissent allowed, makes a lot of people unhappy. Do we give any quarter to that? Or are we at a place where we say, sorry, screw you. You're, you're not going to be able to maintain your little familiar enclaves and bastions. I mean, the fact is actually, we have many places in society where people manage to do that. Uh, and the more privileged you are, the more leeway you have to do that. You know, we, in, living in your little white topias. Uh, white topias. <laughs> white topia. That's a new That's one on a, me, but it's good. It's good. It's a cute term, but it's it's very handy. Um, yeah, so you asked me. Uh, they're under siege, but we can we can put that aside. My first maybe they're related. My first question is, you know, what should Republicans do? What should the right do to try to dislodge? Uh, wokeness. Well, I, I, you know, I don't know would be an honest answer. It's, it's above my pay grade to figure out how to solve, you know, all of society's problems. <laughs> but, but I'll try. I'll try. First of all, you have to we have to have integrity and speak the truth. Those of us who have microphones need to need to speak the truth as we see it and have the courage to incur the wrath as you have done. And I admire you, Amy. Let me just say that again. I admire Amy Wax. I, I admire her integrity. I admire her courage. 
Uh, she sticks her neck out and she sticks by her guns. Uh, she doesn't equivocate. And that is a really rare and admirable uh, talent. Uh, your uh, reward will come in heaven, Amy. Uh, you know, don't look for it here on earth. Uh, but I mean, we have to speak out. We have to live within the truth. Something? I admire you and everybody. You know, I have a, a lot of deplorable friends. They they run the gamut, but um, I have never heard a person say a word against you. Huh. I, I I only praise do I hear of you. Huh. Everybody says, well, Glenn Lowry. Now he he represents the kind of person who should be in academia, a person of real integrity, and has it has. You know, they don't agree with you on absolutely everything, but that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about the sort of ideal academic, the ideal person, the ideal man who isn't afraid to say what's on his mind and say it nicely uh, and get along with all sorts of people like, why can't we all be like Lynn Lowry? So you've got the. the well, that's very of- kind. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so everybody be like Lynn Lowry. That's one solution. The other solution I was thinking of, though, is this is political, Amy. This, at the end of the day, this gets down to who gets elected, who's running the newspaper, who's on the board of trustees of the university, uh, who's in the C-suite, and so forth. And we have to fight these political battles. So therefore, <laughs> whereas the name Christopher Rufo uh, is like uh, Voldemort, it's a name not to be mentioned in the progressive quarters. Right. This is the writer at City Journal who's made a living over the last few years out of exposing the idiocies uh, that are uh, being perpetrated against our children under the uh, label of critical race theory, which the left says doesn't exist. They've got this pat cover story. Critical race theory is something that Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw invented 35 years ago, and it's taught in law schools, but it's not taught in K through 12 completely overlooking the fact that the intellectual progeny of the critical race theorists have laid down the template that is guiding the consultants who are coming into school districts all over this country doing uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion seminar training that is perpetrating ideas about race that some parents are objecting to. Mobilize those parents, win those school committee meetings, uh, make politicians, uh, you know, if... if, um, Jacob Blake. Let me let me say this, Amy. Politics, but politics Amy, Amy, is let, not. Let me just say this. Uh, let me. It's, it's persuasion. I, I'm trying to give an, an example of what I'm talking about. So Jacob Blake is the guy in um, uh, uh, Milwaukee who uh, oh, was in Kenosha. Was in Kenosha, Wisconsin, who got shot to death by a police officer after an altercation in which he attacked the police, resisted arrest, was trying to kidnap the woman's children. Uh, had a knife in his hand, wouldn't respond to officer command, et cetera, et cetera. So he gets shot and he's paralyzed. He's in the hospital. It's the 2020 presidential election and Kamala Harris and Joseph Biden call and communicate with him while he's at his hospital bed and then talk to the country about his suffering. Uh, They're in solidarity with him. They meet with the family to discuss the issue. Now, Jacob Blake is a miscreant. Uh, He's he's no good. I mean, he's a he, you know, he's got a rap sheet a mile long. He gets himself into a fight with the police and he, of his own making and he gets himself shot. Now, a riot ensues and that town is half burnt down to the ground uh, as a consequence of the politicization of that event. That needs to be called out. If you can make Donald Trump into a racist because he said we should take note of who's crossing our border and coming into our country, you can make these people into racists for the pandering uh, to the black vote that they are engaged in when they undertake actions like this. Now, that editorial, as far as I know, hasn't been written. If it's been written, it's in the New York Post or someplace like that, or National Review, if it's been written. And I want to hear you about these conservatives, because they're not saying this kind of thing that I think that they should be saying. How could you make Jacob Blake into a poster boy? How could you give George Floyd, I'm going to say it, a state funeral? with a gold casket pulled by a caisson uh, and uh, dignitaries coming in and standing over his body and preaching to the country about America having to take its knee off of the neck of black people. Uh, That kind of thing should be denounced, not just by Tucker Carlson, uh, but by people who are running for office against uh, the the liberal Democrats, the woke Democrats who have perpetrated this fraud. This is a fraud. This is lying to the people of this country about what's going on. 
and they should be called out. Yeah, well, there's two things going on here. First of all, it is being called out uh, in by journalists, by right wing journalists who are writing in places like the New Criterion, even National Review, which, you know, when National Review has serious cuck tendencies, they still have this fantasy that they can please the left by, you know, trimming and and, you know, making nice and all this, which I think is a totally ludicrous fantasy. But, for example, if you look at Michael Anton, who's a Claremont. Yeah, I know, Claremont, I know Michael. Uh, yeah, and, and he has this very lengthy essay in, in The New Criterion this month called Unprecedented, in which he points out just what you said. You know, a community valorizing George Floyd, who, you know, didn't deserve to die. No, of course not. That, but is, is a criminal. I mean, he's not really an admirable person. He's not someone you should be holding up as a hero, as, you know, someone to emulate, someone to erect statues to. That's that's Or name incredible. acts of Congress after, which is what they've yeah, done. No, 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 no. And, you know, so people like Michael Anton are saying that. Even people in National Review are saying it, although they're sotto voce. But what you're saying is, where are the Republican uh, politicians who are saying that, and you're absolutely right, they are afraid to just come out and say, uh, I'm sorry, but George Floyd doesn't deserve valorization. Here's another thing they're not willing to say. They're not willing to say, you know, every story that we read about a black guy getting killed, armed or unarmed by the police, is a story of a black guy who's resisting the police, who's running from the police, who's fighting the police, who's not behaving the way we should expect ordinary citizens, black, white, and other, to behave towards the police. Now, the woke, the woke have answers to all of this. That's the problem. And frankly, even Republican politicians are afraid of the woke. They have this fantasy, which is parallel to the fantasy of the intelligentsia, that they can woo black voters, that they can please the left, that they can somehow curry favor if they don't point this stuff out, if they don't just come right out and say what a lot of ordinary people are thinking, frankly, Glenn, yeah. uh, which is, you know, why, why do black men so uncooperative with police? Now, the woke say, well, that's because the police are racist. You know, the police are out to get them. Uh, if they cooperate with the police, they'll be murdered. They have to run. They have to resist, which, you know, is bullshit. OK. And, and it just establishes a normative standard that is lawless. Uh, where? Yeah, I agree with you. Where are the politicians who are pointing out the obvious? Uh, even the Republicans are afraid to point out the obvious. And I think until they do echo Michael Anton and echo, you know, the people who are considered far right, who write for the Claremont Review, who write for these online outlets like, you know, UNS, which is actually there are not, not a lot of nut cases on UNS, uh, but there's a lot of good stuff. Um, we're not going to get anywhere. Uh, and I think that the population is ripe for it. Even there are a lot of black people out there. Uh, there are a lot of Hispanics, certainly there are a lot of Hispanics, because we're seeing it in the poll numbers, who are sick and tired of, you know, these sins of omission, uh, these looking the other way, this this inversion of the proper order of things, which is, you know, obey the law, uh, you know, stop committing crimes, you know, be respectful. The bourgeois, the whole bourgeois success sequence thing, you know, if you do all this stuff, you're actually going to. Make your life better, you know, but yeah. we know that if you say it like I said it, you'll be condemned. Well, we need politicians who are willing to go back to the simple copybook precepts. As Thomas Sowell says, no, the truth is not complicated. The truth is pretty simple. Uh, it's a lot simpler than you think. The way forward is, is the basic stuff that we've recognized from day one as the path to success. I don't, I agree with you. It's, it's not happening. I, I, I think the, 
the issue here is people don't want to be perceived as uh, having bad values on the racial questions as being racist or being indifferent or insensitive. And if, if nobody else that. is speaking out and you're the only one except for people who are on the discernible right uh, who are willing to say something, then you, you end up getting, you know, smeared as uh, one of those people, who, you know, uh, who's uh, uh, on the wrong side of the racist racism question and people don't want to well, seem that way but i but it's a collective action problem it's a, exactly I mean, if you get a critical mass exactly. of people because the underlying <laughs> beliefs are consistent with your uh critical uh point of view against wokeness i think yeah. most common sense people know that the police are not the uh enemy the implacable enemy of uh people who are living in the inner city and they know that meritocracy is actually a good thing not a bad thing in order to encourage the uh, allocation of resources to the people who have the most talent and things of this kind. Uh, they know that, but if no one is saying it and if everybody's being called a racist who even hints at it, uh, people are taking cover. But that's not necessarily a stable situation. <clears throat> once enough, you say a critical mass, once, once enough objection starts getting voiced, uh, it becomes safer for more and more people to join the, the uh, dissident, um, uh, you know, heard and eventually we we can flip the script uh, i'd like to think that that's true but what's happened i think in the in virginia with the and and its school districts across the country is is very uh hardening and encouraging but of course it's 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 confined it's kind of a well circumscribed that this is about schools and it's about what they're teaching our children in the schools and you know you don't have to broaden it into some larger comprehensive critique of the whole woke paradigm uh you just need to say uh we we want our we don't like what our children are hearing or something like that without getting into excruciating detail but i think that's that's a wonderful wedge um and you know the problem with wokeness and i i said this in my review of charles murray's book facing reality is that it's an all-encompassing self-affirming self-enclosed worldview that has an answer to absolutely everything, right? Everything is a matter of the oppressor and the oppressed. Uh, uh, racism is everywhere. Everything can be explained by racism. Um, so, you know, it, there's no way to break into that. Uh, so it was a brave act for, I think, the parents in Virginia to actually succeed in doing that. And what I would like to see is that sort of generalized and extended. But even someone like Charles Murray, who you've had, I know, on your I have. Uh, blogging head. Yeah. And I admire no, and nobody admires Charles Murray more than I do. I think he's a master demographer and uh, a very brilliant and original thinker. But I was very disappointed with his book, Facing Reality. It, it starts out a very promising way. He just reports the facts and he talks about what he thinks the implications of the facts are. What does he talk about? He talks about the gap in academic achievement and in cognitive ability that we measure between blacks and whites, and we still measure. That's the first thing. And, you know, the so-called IQ gap. And then he talks about the higher rates of crime in the black community and, and you know, how that has ramifications right. uh, across all different areas. And I think he's absolutely right about that. Avoiding crime is a huge motivator for a lot of people, right? But then in the last chapter, he bizarrely pulls his punches. And instead of saying the left is the problem, wokeness is the problem, we have to attack this kind of multicultural identity politics, which is coming out of the left and is poisoning everything. Instead of saying that and saying, and you know what? If we go back to the American creed, which is impartial, colorblind meritocracy, we are not going to see equal outcomes. Get over it. We've got to face up to it. Instead of saying that, which is what he should have said, he says, but the real problem is white identity politics, which I find completely inexplicable. Uh, I mean, well, let me, let me try to explain. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 first of all, he starts the book by extolling the American creed. That's how he starts the book. The first chapter is yes. not about demography. The first chapter is about the American creed. And the second chapter is also, in a way, not about numbers. It's about how do we think about identity. It's about who are the different groups and how do we think about it. He, he, uh, 
uh, worries that if we don't face reality, the consequence will be the uh, development of a white identity politics, which is bad for the country. I think that's correct, actually. I think both the prognosis that the long run implication of wokeness is white identity politics. If you can't, you can't categorically condemn whiteness, I think, without inducing a pride and ownership of whiteness amongst the people who are resisting your categorical condemnation. So this is not good for the country. Well, I agree with all so that. So he doesn't and make you... your argument, he makes his argument, but, but uh, what? <laughs> no, I'm no, glad, glad. No, here's what he, he says. He ignores the fact that, you know, we've got identity politics out the wazoo. It, it, there is nothing else now, there, it, but it is all non-white identity politics. Our society is dominated by the imperatives of non-white identity politics. So for him to say, but it will be a hundred times worse, the real tragedy, the real danger is white identity politics. I just I don't know that no, that's the real danger. I, I think he thinks that that's the worst thing that can happen. That's where we're headed. That's what he's saying. But it's, 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 an, it's an implicit happen. indictment of identity politics to court, now, not just white identity politics. He's saying that's, that's the end of this uh, sorrowful uh, uh, path that you guys have uh, marked out for ourselves. And if you face up to reality, that is to say, if you take seriously the parts of the book that you described where he carefully documents the test score gap and carefully documents the criminal offending gap, uh, you would, uh, of course, uh, uh, I mean, you, you wouldn't be a leftist if you were to take seriously the, the parts of the book that he's trying to get you to take seriously. If we were to talk about crime and punishment or talk about educational achievement in the way that Charles Murray wants us to, I think you, we'd have to reject the, the left-wing identity politics. Right. But he instead of saying, well, the first our first task is to reject left wing identity politics. And it is the left that needs to accomplish that task. But apart, you know, I think I still think that he exaggerates the quote unquote danger of white identity politics. And here's the problem with with his whole indictment. He doesn't define white identity politics. He names not a single group that he thinks is pushing white identity politics. He names not a single person who is advocating for white identity politics. He doesn't list their belief system. I mean, it's just okay. a kind of a lot of hand-waving okay. focusing on this term, which is a term that the left made up. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't groups that are focused on white interests. So let's take American Renaissance, which I think is, you know, is certainly not by any means the most extreme quote unquote, extreme group out there, uh, they're, you know, they say they're advocating for the interests of white people in society where white people are under siege. And, you know, I happen to know the head of American Renaissance, his name is Jared Taylor, and he's a very refined, you know, highly educated guy who, you know, is, is very uh, well informed and alike. And if you read my essay, you know, that I actually asked him point blank. Like, or do you advocate for going back to anything like Jim Crow, like double standards, like white people have more privileges than everybody else or anything like that? He said, no, no, we'd be happy with the American creed. We'd be perfectly satisfied if we could just return to something like the color blindness that we had for a brief and shining moment uh, after the Civil Rights Act, at least in law in policy, in politics, maybe not in informal interactions, uh, but certainly officially, we had that brief and shining moment of color blindness before we went off on this tangent about equality of results. He says, but we recognize that because of the differences in orientation and ability, that you know whites would be very influential in our society. They they would dominate in a lot of fields. And that's what woke people call white supremacy, right? So I'm not sure that Murray and Taylor are that far apart in what they perceive to be the outcomes from the American creed. So why is Murray condemning him? 
investing uh, in uh, the well-being of white people creates, in Mary's view, as I understand it, this, this idea that there are white interests, the idea that whites would come to see themselves as a collectivity in the same way that people of color, quote unquote, are doing, that their politics would be organized around their whiteness is bad for the country. It takes us further and further down the identitarian road. Uh, and the end of that process is, is uh, division and conflict in the country. Um, well, it's this, reactive. I think that white let, people let, have- Let me just say this, Amy. Let me just say this, let me just say this. Okay, so the left have made a big deal out of white cops killing black uh, youngsters. It would be easy to make a big deal out of black thugs killing innocent white people. Very easy, because there are a lot of white people killed by black people. You could have a website. Actually, it may well I, exist. It may well yeah. exist. You could have a website where every day of the year was dedicated to an innocent white person who had been ravaged, home invaded, carjacked, uh, randomly uh, sliced with a knife at a sub subway station, uh, shot at uh, two o'clock in the morning because they were walking along the wrong street at the wrong time. You could easily do it. Easily. You could take the Waukesha massacre where a white town. I've been to Waukesha, Wisconsin. It's the most Republican county in the state of Wisconsin. It looks like something out of a Norman Rockwell painting. It's a very, very white place. They're having a Christmas parade. A black man with a rap sheet a mile long drives a vehicle into that crowd, kills grandmothers, kills grandmothers, dancing grannies, they call themselves. And I think two or three of them actually got killed by this guy. Uh, dozens were injured. He mowed down a parade of white people with a vehicle. Now, that could easily be interpreted. I don't know if Jared Taylor talks like this, but I could hear him saying it. Black thug let out on by one of these George Soros loving uh, prosecutors who are getting rid of uh, pretrial detention and uh, not bringing cases against property crimes that are below a certain level and are basically throwing the jail doors open. And one of those people who was let out on a thousand dollar bond for a crime that he should have been held for mowed down a parade of white people, a black racist. You look at his uh, Facebook posts and whatnot. Uh, this is uh, Daryl Brooks. Um, and uh, apparently he doesn't like white people and he mowed them down. Now that's a crime against white people. White people need to defend themselves. That's the kind of talk that I could hear Jared Taylor engaging in. I don't know if he said it or not. But that's what Charles. Mar that's what Charles. Mar okay, then more power to Jared Taylor. Let me not. Uh, in, let me not malign him. It's not about him. That's what Charles is worried about. He, he's he's worried about an American politics in which you mobilize white people against the depredations of these vicious criminals who happen to be black, who are black thugs in the minds of the demagogue who's going to be pushing this political line and says, if white people don't defend ourselves, these are militias. They're going to get armed. They're going to end up in conflict with people, then no one, no one else will. You see what the politicians are doing? The politicians are siding with the black thugs. We white people need to defend ourselves. Now, if that's not bad for America, I don't know what is, Amy. Well, I mean, the real question is, what are white people allowed to say given the reality? Now, part of the reality is not, you said, oh, white people are being victimized by blacks. Well, to some extent, yes, because blacks do have higher Crime rates Vastly higher as Mary documents in that thing. Mind-bogglingly okay. higher. Okay, okay. But mostly black people are victimizing black people, yeah. if the truth be told. Of course. You know, so of course. That's, that's the truth. But let's take white people who are now under assault, under attack. We have all sorts of rhetoric about how white people are awful. They're a cancer. You know, uh, they white supremacy is hideous. We have to extirpate every remnant of it. There's a lot of anti-white rhetoric. So I guess, you know, the question I have is, what are people like Jared Taylor allowed to say? Nothing. Do they have to be completely impartial and colorblind and neutral? Because there are two possibilities here. One is to say, well, we embrace the American creed. Race has nothing to do with it. Let's keep race out of it. Let's keep identity out of it. Let's go back to this creed. And that is what we stand for. And, you know, we don't, we don't see race. The other path is, uh-oh, we now have this 
This ideology is called wokeness. It's taken over all of our dominant institutions. Um, and it has anti-white elements that are actually in concrete ways disadvantaging white people. White people are uh, seeing some bad stuff happen to them. They're losing out uh, because of wokeness. And white people should take notice as white people and recognize that they are now in important sense a disadvantaged group. And, you know, we're here to to advocate for them, not necessarily to sort of stir up a race war, which, you know, your rhetoric suggested and which I I don't you know approve of at all, of course, but to point out that there is a group of individuals who are engaging in a kind of ethno-masochistic crouch and they need an advocate. I, I, yeah. I would say Jared Taylor is trying to fulfill that role. Now we could argue about whether, you know, he goes beyond that, yeah. whether he, I don't know. What do you think? No, do you I, think I, I, I think, that I think, and I said this in my speech at the national conservatism conference, I said, if you keep running around telling white people that they are the root of all evil in society, that uh, they and their ancestors from colonialism and slavery on down to the present day are the re responsible for the uh, poor condition of peoples of color. Uh, if you tell them that they are, uh, you, you can't teach history, uh, their way you got to take down the statues of the founding fathers, you got, that they got to pay reparations, et cetera. You keep, you know, they're implicitly or explicitly supremacists. They are, they are racist for making the most obvious observations about the most obvious thing. You keep doing that you're gonna get a reaction. And that reaction could go along the following lines. People could ask the question, okay, we live in the modern world. Uh, you've got dentistry and medicine. You've got uh, space travel. You've got uh, relativity theory. You've got uh, Darwinian theory of the origin of the species. You've got everything in between. Where did it come from? What's the foundation of modern civilization in the world today? The reason that the Chinese are doing so well is because they have a adopted Western scientific and commercial practices and so forth and so on. You stand on a foundation that was built by Westerners. What about the enlightenment? What about the ideas that are implicit in our governing institutions that allow us to live in a society in which we can enjoy the benefits of liberty and order? Where did it come from? What's the root of it? The root of it is Europe. You're, you're standing on a civilization that is built in substantial part by the achievements of Europeans. Uh, I'm white and I'm proud of that. I'm, I'm proud of the symphonies. Uh, I, I'm proud of, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's, where, so that's what you're going to get. No, no, no. I, you got, you just, <laughs> I, I, I said it because it would be easy for someone to say, and I'm sure that people, Jared Taylor may be one of them, are saying similar things. It would be very tempting in reaction to this blanket condemnation of whiteness that I'm getting from the Ibram X. Kindies of the world to embrace such a doctrine. And it would also be disastrous for our country if 60 oh. or 70 percent of the population came to be thinking in that way. Oh, I think you see, this is this is so interesting. OK, let's stop for a moment. So I, you know, I don't know whether American read. I, I go to their website every once in a while and I think they have people are writing and saying, yes, we're proud to be European. Europe is the source of all wonderful things of modernity where you have outsized contributions. Frankly, I think all of this is true. I'm just gonna put my cards on the table, right? I'm proud to be European. I'm proud to be white. I'm proud to be European. Uh, I'm Jewish, so I'm, I am European. Uh, and I think that all of that is totally legitimate. Now at the end of your beautiful speech, here's what you said. But if there was an organization that said all of that, that would be disastrous. Why? We need someone to say those things, if only to provide the kind of perspective and balance on the relentless drumbeat of condemnation that we are hearing. That's not I the only it, alternative. I mean, uh, that is where we're headed. That's, I, I think that's where we're headed. But we need to abandon, we need to abandon the identitarian matrix altogether, oh. in my view. But you think that's, you think that's utopian. So no, you're saying not that I do. I think it's a great ideal, Glenn. I am going to advocate for it. But the original sin here is the left. 
The left has enshrined identitarian thinking. It is everywhere, everywhere you turn, every time. I agree with that, but but two wrongs don't make a right. They're wrong. They're wrong about that. Two wrongs don't make a right. Okay, I don't think it's identitarian thinking to say and tell people and inform them. Okay, that Europe has been the source and the author of so much of what they benefit from. I don't think that's an illegitimate point to make. I mean, have no, you read I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Uh, and, and, okay. and, and, more, and moreover, I would, I would go further. I would go further. I would say, although my ancestors, most of them are descended from Africans, that I am a man of the West. That, that, that I am, I'm not going to call myself a European. Somehow that doesn't make any sense. I'm an American. I'm an American. But my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather were born right here in North America. I, the only language I know is English. I studied a little German. Um, my intellectual uh, maturity is, has been fed by my access to this great tradition. It's a European tradition. I don't speak Swahili. I'm an American. So m the fact that I'm not white doesn't exclude me from the patrimony of the modern world, which rests in substantial part, not entirely, of course, not entirely, upon uh, the, uh, what, the developments in Europe over the last 500 years. So, so I, I don't equate the racial identity uh, 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 matrix with my uh, belonging to a tradition which is Western. That's my tradition every bit as much yeah. as it is yours, I would say. Yeah, so this is where things, I think, you know, a certain degree of nuance and subtlety is really important, okay? So one of the tenets, one of the, the sort of uh, admirable legacies of the European Enlightenment tradition, which we all benefit from, is precisely its universalism, which people from all over the world can embrace and take advantage of, right? We have all of these achievements in science and technology, and those, of course, are completely race blind and neutral, and everybody can benefit from them and carry them forward and advance them, right? And we also have a series of political uh, commitments and ideals and notions about democracy, about rule of law, uh, about uh, you know participation, about rights, which are also not tied to whiteness. They're not tied to race. They're universal. So that's one of the great achievements of the Enlightenment. And that is what you're speaking of. You're saying the Western tradition is something that I, as a non-white person and a non-European, can embrace as my own. Right. But it is not contradictory to recognize that, but also to acknowledge that whether we like it or not, all this stuff is the product of a particular group of people in a particular place at a particular time, and that there is a certain degree of pride that the ancestors of those, that the uh, progeny of those people can pay in what their ancestors did. I mean, I think it gets very complicated. You know, what are the appropriate expressions of ethnic pride and then when do we get into inappropriate expressions of ethnic pride? How does one express that pride without um, racializing it or overly racializing it? Uh, we haven't really worked that out. And I think part of the reason we haven't is because we refuse to discuss this stuff. It, you know, you're not allowed in the public forum to say, hey, sorry to report. But modernity is almost exclusively the product of European civilization. And if you look back, you recognize that, you know, civilizations and cultures have risen and fallen. And what we see is a pattern where promising developments have kind of flattened out in Asia, in the Muslim world, and Europe just took off. You know, and I went to a conference where people were trying to explain this. I said, every explanation I hear about this is full of holes. You know, why did Europe 
take off and leave everybody else in the dust. Of course, they want to avoid anything politically incorrect. Here's, here's one explanation I heard at this conference. Well, Europe consisted of a lot of small polities and city-states, and they were in competition, so there was this kind of competitive dynamic. I said, that like doesn't pass the smell test because the Indian tribes in America had exactly the same little polities and different tribes that were competing with each other, and they didn't go anywhere for a thousand years. They were like flatlined, okay? No written language, no science, no technology, no developments in uh, political developments. So that's bullshit. I, you know, we, we don't, Glenn, here's the bottom line. Look, look we, Amy, I, I don't know the answer to the question. They'll be talking about it for 500 years, uh, you know, the scholars and whatnot. But the fact is that I mean, I, I, I think the Industrial Revolution, you know, goes a long way. I, I think the, the uh, uh, Age of Enlightenment, I think the uh, advent of the uh, era of uh, scientific uh, objectivity uh, and whatnot, uh, Francis Bacon and all of that. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, but this is something that people write big books about. I mean, it's not it's not an easy I know. thing to, there, to there speculate. Are but in the course, the European <laughs> European developments were not unrelated to things that were going on in other parts of the world. And uh, it, it's a it's a complex dynamic. I mean, uh, you know, so but but the, the, the fact of the matter is that after 1500 stuff started happening in Europe over the next couple of hundred years that have set the stage for the modern world. That is absolutely a fact. Is it racial? Gosh, gosh, is it racial? Really? I, I, I would I would be reluctant to embrace a racial account of that. I mean, genetic. I mean, this kind of thing, biogenetic, I, you know. I don't know that the evidence is there for that. Can we at least agree on one thing, okay? So the question that you could legitimately ask is, okay, okay, you know, it's actually since 1700 or maybe even before that, that Europe just outclassed and outgunned everybody. Um, what what do we say about that? What What are we allowed to say about that? What are we allowed to think about that? Well, let me put it in the negative. Here's one thing that we shouldn't be saying and one thing that we shouldn't be thinking which is that you know, European culture is a cancer on humanity, uh, that it's entirely negative, that there's nothing good to be said about it. We can't admire it, yeah, we agree. can't valorize it, we can't, I mean, that we need to get rid of. Yeah, Here, here's, I, here's the argument they're gonna make, I mean, They're gonna say, what about colonialism? They're gonna say Europe raped the world. They, okay. they stole the labor of the Africans. They stole the raw materials from the Asians and the Africans. Uh, and uh, they uh, exterminated the native population in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it's a rapacious, uh, greed-fueled, uh, militaristic. They had, they got a few uh, steps ahead of everybody else with the with the weaponry and the metal uh, metallurgy and the whatnot in uh, transport. And they used that uh, minor advantage in order to primitive accumulation in the terms of the Marxists in order to dominate, exploit, oppress. And the foundation of European wealth and success is built on the graves of, you know, they're standing on the broken bodies and the skulls of the hundreds of millions who were pressed into service or dominated in one way or another by uh, European militaristic hegemony. Okay, well, I, I hear you, and I know that is the sort of standard narrative, but the problem with this narrative, there are several problems with it. The first is, you know, the Europeans did that to, to uh, non-Europeans, which I'm not advocating or saying it's you know good or admirable, because they could, because they were more advanced, so they were better at conquering and oppressing other people, and they were often you know merciless about it. But the people of Africa, the people of Asia, the people of the steppes, they were constantly fighting and killing each other. It, it, people in North America, they just weren't as good or as efficient at it. They they didn't do it at, you know, on the on the large sweeping scale that Westerners did because they didn't have the technology, but they were not nice to each other, uh, Glenn. I mean, this I is it. the pattern of humanity from from absolutely day one. The second point to make about colonialism, all right, is to lay at the feet of colonialism, every backwardness and, and difficulty of the third world is crazy. I mean, the Europeans really didn't arrive in Africa in any significant numbers. 
until a fairly late, late in the date, 19th century. Yeah, I mean, everything that the fact that Africa fell behind is not the fault of the West. Yeah. Right. The fact that China kind of, you know, flatlined out after a promising start is not the fault of the West, uh, that the Muslim uh, culture didn't go anywhere, didn't develop the Industrial Revolution, didn't develop any kind of scientific, uh, you know, acumen that didn't generate the economic prosperity and riches uh, and wealth that the West generated is not the West's fault. I'm sorry, it is not. I reject the idea that we are the source of all of this stuff. And nobody who's sensible and objective, who knows the facts and the history, can possibly take that position. So that's what I have to say about colonialism. Well, I'm reminded of uh, the opening chapter of Jared Diamond's book, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, where he describes the conquistadors' encounter with the Incas uh, in, uh, you know, South America, and, you know, how they slaughtered them because they had uh, they had swords and they had, you know, and they were on horses, and and uh, the other the other team just didn't have the technological weaponry, and blood was flowing in the streets. Exactly. Um, you know, I'm also. And if you know anything about American Indians, which I, I find fascinating, you know, you know, these people were constantly at war with each other. Well, they didn't have guns. They had arrows, right? They had hatchets. So there was a limit to how much damage they could do. But when they conquered other tribes and they were constantly yeah. doing that, right, they uh, they tortured them. I think they were yeah. awful to them. I mean, they they were merciless to them. It's and if they'd had our guns and our technology, they just would have done it on a grander scale. I don't see them as being any any nicer. Yeah, the noble savage uh, <laughs> uh, metaphor exactly. here is is not true to reality. Yeah. I think I think that's right. But I'm also remembering uh, was his name Adam Hochschild's book um, about uh, King Leopold's ghost is what the book is called. And it's a history of the relationship between the Belgian and the and the Congolese and the extraction of rubber and, you know, it, it, and total exploitation. Okay. I mean, but that's awful, Amy. Oh, they got the manifest of the boats. The boats are going down from Liverpool down to, uh, to Africa. They're going full of ammunition and rifles. They're coming back full of, uh, rubber and, and extremely valuable, you know, uh, raw material. And, uh, King Leopold is living large. He's got his estate and, you know, his, his mistresses and whatnot. And uh, it's terribly exploitative. And, you know, that's just one example. Well, I know, read a book about the Lakota. You know, there's a new book about the Lakota Indians. It's, it's, it's pretty old by now, a couple of years. Um, you know, and they try to make out like, you know, these people are sophisticated, noble savages. But the fact is that they did awful things to each other. I mean, the tortures that they inflicted on each other uh, really... They can compete with what uh, happened in the Congo. Um, they, they're they no better. I think the uh, strongest and- argument on behalf of your position, and, and we're going to have to conclude, but I, I think the strongest argument is that the West contained the moral and intellectual resources to develop movements against these very uh, uh, anti-humanist uh, practices that had evolved within the West. I mean, they, there was abolition. There, there, there was the... Uh, you know, feminism. There, there was uh, the uh, extension of the franchise to people who didn't own property. There, there was the uh, uh, con- contempt and condemnation of the excesses of uh, of uh, uh, colonialism, and those came out of the West. The very humanistic counter to the exploitative and the dominating uh, practices were fueled by ideas from the West. Right. So we we have a inherently progressive culture. I think the word progressive has acquired some negative connotations. But in fact, you know, everything you say is true. We have the seeds of our own reform planted within the fundamental commitments of our culture. And I think that's something else that isn't praised enough, that isn't appreciated enough. And once again, are our school children being taught that? Are our school children being taught all of the positive, wonderful, praiseworthy things that they should be Not as much as they should be. And they should be taught, those children, that even if they look like me, this is their tradition. Yes, they are the inheritors of the Western traditions, the Western uh, innovations, 
the Western developments. They are yours. Take possession of them. And you're right. That has to be fundamentally a colorblind idea. And I don't hear that being peddled at all. It's and there you can't escape it. There is no school that you can go to practically. Uh, you have to search far and wide to find a place where those sorts of things are being said to kids. Uh, I, I would like to see more of it. So maybe that's what the right should be focusing on is, you know, let's let's change the messaging. Um, yeah. OK, Amy, why don't we call it a day? It's been fun talking to you. We've covered a lot of ground and created enough controversy for a week's worth of reaction to The Glenn Show. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Amy. I really appreciate yes, I'm it. Sorry we didn't get around to bashing feminism. That would have been fun. Uh, but we'll do that next, next time, time, Amy. Yes. Okay. Next time.